<clears throat> okay. Hi. <laughs> so my name is Arlene and welcome to Tuckerton the People. This is going to be our new exhibit. Um, so it's replacing Tuckerton 1900. So when you come into the lighthouse and go to your left hand side, you'll walk into the new exhibit. Um, just a little bit about ourselves first. Um, I'm Arlene and I'm the folk like, folk -like director at Tuckerton. I uh, just started back in January. Um, got my bachelor's degree from Temple and my master's degree from Monmouth. And I uh, concentrated on both anthropology and history. Um, I've worked in different museum settings such as the University of Penn and Temple Univers uh, University uh, Museum. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, this is exciting. And I'll tell you a little bit about Adriana. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I'm Adriana Martinez. I am the Education Director and Coordinator here at the Tuckerton Seaport. I graduated with a BA in History from Stockton in 2018, um, but I have taken a ton of classes in Museum Studies and Museum Education at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. Um, I have experience uh, in both non-traditional and traditional learning environments for students and adults throughout Atlantic City, a couple different places, um, as well as Philadelphia. Um, I've also interned and have done some projects for Philadelphia's Magic Gardens, the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University, and of Laurel Hill Cemetery. Um, and I've been with the Seaport since November, and it's been a whirlwind, but it's been a lot of fun planning this. So you may be asking yourself, why Tuckerton 1900? It's been there for a bit. Um, when we were looking at the exhibit, we realized there was a lot of artifacts, many, many artifacts and many, many photos and articles from our collection inside. It started um, kind of piling up around the exhibit, displayed nicely, but there was a lot. It ended up causing this larger problem of there being too many stories and too many artifacts um, with a lot of history being displayed. So not one story could shine on its own. Uh, it resulted in a little bit of an overwhelming experience for a new visitor. I'm not exactly sure what to make of all of the stuff that was kind of just being thrown at them. Um, this exhibit also had a second problem which stemmed from the name and overarching theme of this exhibit. Um, so it's called Tuckerton 1900. And if you've been to the seaport before and have walked into this exhibit, um, you also might know it as turn of the century Tuckerton. It goes by both those names. But with those names, it locked the exhibit in one moment in time. Um, and all of these items that were displayed were inspired by the turn of the century or, or actually from the turn of the century, the turn of the century. But the initial goal of this exhibit was to connect it to now rather than keep the story in the past. So when reevaluating this exhibit, we asked ourselves, how can we make this exhibit relevant to the modern day? We decided to start from the beginning of even planning Tuckerton 1900 uh, to find the answer to that question. So the original inspiration for the exhibit was the Tuckerton census from the year 1900. And we had this big lectern with a whole bunch of like big blown up pages from the census, all the entire census there. And the initial goal of this exhibit, Tuckerton 1900, was to have the visitor look at the census and connect with the everyday people who were in it by looking at the, occupa at the occupations and the names in order to connect with these people and see what they did. Maybe even find that they were more similar to how we are now than they'd expect. But when we were looking at this exhibit, we realized that there are many, many ways to connect to the past from the present. And even this little town of Tuckerton to the people who travel here from across the country and sometimes the world. Um, so using that census, that's where our brainstorming kind of began. So right. uh, do you wanna do this? <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll do this slide. Mm -hmm. So basically what we did was we used genealogy, we used personal stories, uh, we contacted people that were actually still in the area, um, these descendants 
Um, so we actually, you know, got a little inside scoop about each person. Um, well, the people that we could trace back to today. Uh, we use their history and we use primary sources. Um, each person has a story and you can find these stories um, through archives, through newspaper clippings, through ancestry.com, uh, through military archives. And you could pretty much piece them all together just to find out the full story about each person. Um, so that brings us to, to the research. Um, so we used Ancestry, uh, we traced back different family members and built these family trees um, to have them from back then till today. So that's how we were able to contact some people today or even um, contact people from like historical societies um, to see uh, if there was any artifacts or anything that they left behind um, so we could you know, see it today. Um, and then we also looked into military archives and the census. Uh, the census actually tells you a lot, um, you know, aside from who they were in their name and their children, we found out what kind of occupations, um, if they had any children that passed away within those 10 years. Um, and you can see how their occupations change over time. Um, maybe one year they were a mariner or, or a bayman, and then next they were, you know, running a store. Um, so our goal uh, for this exhibit is to trace back generations and to take a look into their lives, um, especially now that we have so much technology and it's really easy to look into people's lives today because we have Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram. Well, back then they didn't have any of that stuff. The only thing they had was the census and that's the only way we could look into their lives. Um, so we were just, taking a glimpse of them back then until to the turn of the century, we traced them all the way back to 2020. Maybe there were still people in the area that, you know, they still live. Maybe they still had a building standing up, um, artifacts, you know, so. Adriana. All right, so we started kind of with what we had and one of the things we had the most information on was Quakers and Tuckerton. Uh, Quakers are vital to the early history of Tuckerton. So incorporating their history into this exhibit was necessary for this larger story we we're trying to piece together. And essentially the colonial history of this area, Little Lake Harbor is Quaker. By the year 1700, about 70% of West Jersey, the little sliver we're in, uh, was Quaker. Um, the Little Egg Harbor Monthly Meeting House. Uh, it's a meeting house that was built in 1863. And you can see here that there is a picture, um, an older picture of what it looked like. Uh, this is from the archives of the Library of Congress, I believe. And the house still stands here, but it looks much different than this picture that's here. Um, it has been said, we found in an article that this house has re been rebuilt over 50 times. We aren't exactly sure how many times it's been rebuilt, but it has been rebuilt at least once. Um, as I said, the house is still standing. It's actually a short stroll from the seaport itself, and it's still being used to this day by Quakers in the area. Um, so Quakers believe that the presence of God exists in everyone, which puts all men on equal footing. Because of this, Quakers have had a relatively complex history with slavery. At first, slavery was approved of, as long as you baptized those who were enslaved and allowed them to be part of the church, everything uh, was okay. But eventually this led to a schism. If all men are equal in the eyes of God, then why should any one man own others? As time went on, Quakers began to stand up in favor of abolition. And it also helped that there were many Quakers by this time who were African-American, who were doing good in the community, serving their community, being just proper Quakers in general. So there was no need for this sort of caste system uh, that existed at the time. Um, in any case, Quakers ended up playing a major role in the migration of African-Americans to this area. Um, and that brings us to the very first family we're gonna talk about. So the Maps family starts with these Tuckerton Quakers and the family line eventually 
makes history on a national level from what we were finding when we were uh, figuring out the family tree here. David Maps is where this story starts. He was one of the very first African-American Quakers to settle in Tuckerton. He married another African-American Quaker named Grace, whose wedding vows we found over the course of our research. Uh, they're actually pictured in this slide and we will have a larger blown up copy in our exhibit. Very happy to find those. Um, David Maps was known to house other Quakers traveling to the area from England. We've had, uh, we found a record from a group consisting of William Rickman and William Forrester, who were traveling with Mildred Morris Ratcliffe, John Lloyd, and Mary Steer. Uh, from this account, we have found that David Maps was evidently a gracious host. He was spoken very well of. Um, he also had a farm. He was a farmer. Um, and other than that, he didn't have like a larger historic influence other than like that little bit in the area. Um, Grace Maps, unfortunately, died before David and he would remarry a white woman named Anna. They had a daughter named Grace Ann Maps, um, who I've listed here in this slide, and she would go on to make history in her own right. She is a published poet and eventually became a teacher. Grace Ann was also the first African-American woman to graduate from New York Central, Central College. Um, she also became a principal at the Quaker Institute for Colored Youth in Philadelphia. In our exhibit, we have found um, some of her poems. So we will also have a little bit of those in the exhibit for you guys as well. If you move on to the next one. So the Parsons family, they, are a major player in Tuckerton's history with their business still running to this day. They're also a perfect example of the strong connection of this town and the Barnegat Bay's natural resource, which is seafood. For this exhibit, we'll start with, for this part of the exhibit, we're going to start with E. Walter Parsons, who constructed the original clam house in 1935. It's pictured here and recreated with love and care here at the Tuckerton Seaport, if you happen to stop by. Um, e. Walter Parsons married into the Mathis family, uh, who were the origina originators of this clamming and seafood family business. He married Sarah Mathis and received, and received this business from Daniel Mathis, Sarah's father, um, who was a descendant of the originator, John Mathis. This whole entire business goes back like to the early um, 1900s. So Parsons eventually over time would grow to be a major supplier of clams to the Campbell Soup Factory, um, being, the, um, being a major uh, supplier, giving about 9 million clams per year uh, by the 1940s. Um, they still work the bay to this day, selling seafood and acting as a key player in oyster reef recovery. Um, Tuckerton was once known as Clam Town because of the clamming industry that has been here. And with that major industry came a lot of damage to the environment. Clams and oysters are filter feeders. They help filter the water of any sorts of toxins, keep the environment running smoothly um, in this wonderful ecosystem we have here. Um, and Parsons has always kind of been a player to um, put more oysters and more clams back out into the bay. Right now they are a major part of oyster reef recovery. With Stockton University, they've created the Tuckerton Reef, um, which is a place to seed and cultivate oysters sustainably while protecting the environment. So that's me. So um, our next person that's in our exhibit is the Fox Kramer family, um, more specifically Cinderella Kramer. Um, she was the first woman um, to actually ride the Tuckerton Railroad. And there's actually a very um, interesting story about that too. Um, she was actually the first unofficial woman, first woman to ride the Tuckerton Railroad because of her friend. Um, Cinderella's friend Bill Day was actually one of the engineers who were lay laying down the railroad tracks uh, for 
the Tuckerton Railroad. Um, he only had about six miles left um, to, you know, complete it. And he asked Cinderella one day, hey, I'm going to lay down these tracks. Would you like to come with me? Of course, she said yes. Um, took a little bit of convincing I was reading. Um, and the next day she actually went out and went with Bill Day and went on to the train carriage, um, pulled the lever and she was officially the first woman to ride the Tuckerton Railroad. Um, I thought it was really, really cute. Um, there is some newspaper clippings. Uh, here's a little snippet on the side, but we have the, uh, the full newspaper clipping at the exhibit. So if you want to come and look at it, you are welcome to. And there's actually a picture of the carriage that she actually rode in. Um, it is currently, I want to say it's in Beach Haven, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> uh, but I know you can still look at it, um, a little bit of piece of history. Um, she actually rode the Tuckerton Railroad in November 1871. Um, and she actually has a interesting story other than that as well. Um, she was married back, um, in the 1830s to someone named Foundation, uh, Fountain, Fountain, that's his name. Um, Cinderella and Fountain are very two unique names. Uh, that's another thing that actually pulled me towards them, uh, is because of their names. She's actually you know, Cinderella before Cinderella was actually a, a person uh, that we know today. Um, and while I was actually looking through her family tree, I found uh, out some other interesting things, such as I know her great grandson was a uh, stockholder during the Great Depression. Um, she was actually from a lot of money. Uh, she never remarried uh, after her husband, uh, Fountain, was actually lost out in sea. Um, we did some deep diving and found out that we have um, the Barnegat Historical Society actually had some photos, uh, a shawl, a box that was actually from her that was donated by her granddaughter, Nina. Um, and we actually have it in our exhibit now. Um, so if you want to come and see that, feel free to come over to the exhibit. Um, and you can learn more about the Tuckerton Railroad as well, um, because we also have an exhibit about the Tuckerton Railroad. Um, so that also brings us to the next person, um, the Lippmans. Isidore Lippmann was a Jewish immigrant from Russia. He came over to Tuckerton and settled around um, the 1900s. Um, after the 1900s, he relocated to different places within Ocean County. Um, he was a merchant who owned a dry goods store. Um, so he sold different clothing. He sold uh, flour, coffee. Um, he also sold different textiles. Um, anything you could think of, he probably sold. It was kind of think about it as the Walmart of the 1900s. That's basically what he had, uh, which was actually interesting. Um, because he actually had his store uh, passed down to his kids after he became a real estate agent, which I found, which was I thought was very interesting. He was a real estate agent and insurance um, salesman during the Great Depression as well. Um, his son, Nathan, worked as a telegraph messenger uh, during the 1800, I mean, 1900s, and he eventually worked for a chemical company. And then you could see um, during this, in the census, it actually states um, what he worked at. It also shows where he worked at uh, with different primary sources that we found. We found out what the name was. Uh, it's American Stores Co., very original. <laughs> and um, yeah, he passed it down to his kids. And what I thought was really interesting about his family, other than them being um, immigrants from Russia who are also Jewish, um, his daughter also had a job which was very different during that time, uh, mainly because women weren't allowed to have jobs. Most of the time when you're looking through the census, you notice that the head of the house, which is usually the man, usually has a job. Then the wife, who usually never has a job, and then the kids. The sons probably have a job, but the daughters usually never have a job. Um, so what I found was different was his daughter was also 
employed. She was a, a stenographer, I believe. Um, and she wrote different um, letters and paperwork for courts um, or for um, people who wrote books. So you'll talk and then she'll type. So she could type as fast as how someone could talk, um, which I thought was very interesting. Um, I found out that um, his store, the American Stores uh, Company, is actually listed in James Berg's historical um, archives. Um, and there is actually a lot of different things about his, uh, his family. Um, but you have to come to the exhibit to learn more about it. <laughs> oh, how do I click on the next page? Ah, okay. So speaking of Isidore, we go over to W.C. Jones. W.C. Jones and Isidore were, I don't want to say the same person, but they were similar. They both owned stores, which um, they were both entrepreneurs. Um, they sold a lot of different things in their store. So for W.C. Jones, he was everything. He was a druggist. He was a jeweler who fixed glasses. Um, he was a movie theater operator. He was a photographer. He sold um, paper goods. He stole perfumes. He fixed watches. Anything you could think of, this man did it. Um, and uh, he also actually served in the Spanish-American War as well as um, a hospital servant. So he know he knew how to do basic uh, simple surgeries, which is, I think, crazy. Um, I don't know how to do simple surgery. <laughs> so it, him knowing to do all these different things, um, it's, it's really interesting. Um, he knew how to repair things, he, like watches. Um, cameras, um, he did developing, um, and we actually were able to trace down his ancestors who still live in Tuckerton till this day. Um, I actually had the opportunity to interview her, um, Kathleen Engelston, who is a historical um, artist in the area. She actually uses W.C. Jones photographs that he took back in the 1900s, and she makes paintings of them. Um, she also goes around uh, New Jersey and paints different um, sceneries uh, for the Bay. Um, any natural um, sceneries you could, uh, you'll see throughout the Jersey Shore, she usually paints them. Um, she owns a store She's very tech savvy. She has her own Etsy store as well. Um, and, you know, she's a, actually a really awesome person. And knowing the story about W.C. Jones and then talking to her, uh, I noticed that her whole family is a family of artists and entrepreneurs. Um, her great great grandfather, uh, W.C. Jones's father, he was a photographer. And if you could look down at the slide, um, we actually took a snippet of the census, and you could see that he was he was listed as a photographer. Um, she told me a story that when W.C. Jones was younger, he and his father would go around Tuckerton and um, South Jersey and took portraits of people, um, and then that's how they made their living. Um, and then when some W.C. Jones got a little older, he used his photography skills and then he opened up his own store and he was the, you know, the pharmacist of Tuckerton. Um, any, anything that you needed, you would go to his store because he, he knew everything and he had everything. Um, and we're lucky enough to actually have some things from him in the exhibit. Uh, Kathleen donated some of his artifacts and we actually had some of his artifacts from his store that are actually housed at the exhibit right now. Um, so when you come and visit, you could see that. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. So um, another part of the exhibit is as, so we're tracing these people and we're learning about people. We also want to learn about you as well. Um, so we actually teamed up with uh, Fox Iron, Iron Fox Typewriters, who is a um, local um, pro, like uh, business, there you go. It's a local business uh, who actually had this program where they uh, donate their typewriters for a certain period of time. And um, the program helps promote writing um, and literature as well. Um, 
so we had our fun uh, spin to it. Uh, we teamed up with them where you can actually go and type on this typewriter and in, in the exhibit and you can uh, share your story with us or you could take it home and share it with your loved ones. Um, after you type up your story, you can post it up to our Tuckerton uh, Seaport family tree. And um, from there, you know, we could um, share your story with everybody. You could talk about something about yourself or if you have like a relative that does something, you know, different, um, you know, we will love to hear these stories. Um, and we also are working with uh, Story Corps as well, which is uh, a oral history program uh, which these oral histories and these interviews will be uploaded to the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. Uh, think about it as the Google for oral histories. So you could go on this website, type in Tuckerton, and all of these stories from the area will come up and you can listen to these stories. Um, and these will be archived and you know, hopefully future generations when they wanna learn more about Tuckerton or the Jersey Shore, they could go onto Story Corps and they could look up these stories and listen to these stories from the people who lived this history. Um, and we have a community page, uh, which is up now. You can actually, um, I believe we have two interviews up right now, one with Kathleen Ingleston and the other one with Nikki Guyverson. Uh, you can learn more about their stories and their life within you know, the Jersey Shore, South Jersey. Uh, they have very interesting stories. Uh, Kathleen will tell you the story about W.C. Jones and how, you know, her childhood and everything living, um, being born in 1930 and, you know, living through all that history until 2022. Um, and she's still doing a bunch of things. Um, and then Nikki Guyberson, uh, she has different programs within uh, Pork Republic. She runs her own felting um business. Uh, she also teaches um, classes and she actually comes to the seaport, um, I believe once a month to do felting classes. So you can actually meet her. Um, and one of the more interesting things is she is the first woman of the um, first woman mayor in Port Republic. And uh, she tells you a little bit about that inside scoop. So feel free to come visit our community page um, and you can listen to these stories. Um, my plan is to add more um, as time goes by so we can have a large collection and you can, you know, learn about the people of South Jersey. Um, and then Adriana will tell you about the last one. <laughs> so with all of this, we really want to um, encourage visitors to interact with history, share their stories, seek ways to discover history on their own. And that extends to children as well. So um, we are gonna have a little bit of a coloring page drawing activity called My Family Story Tree. Um, it is a page with these uh, different drawing prompts and rather than having writing prompts that may be for the typewriter um, that will encourage children to uh, look at their families, look at important people in their families um, and talk to uh, their parents or any other adults that come with them uh, to start keeping family histories because family histories really start um, from your own family memories, uh, things that start from when you're a child. Uh, like we, um, like Arlene has um, interviewed uh, Kathleen Engel Engelson. Um, and one of the best ways, and of course, families always uh, keep their kids' drawings. Um, it's just a nice little memento to kind of keep and have and start having kids um, understand the importance of keeping uh, the memories of their families alive um, and their importance of their story and that family history. Um, we also are working on a couple of other interactives uh, for this exhibit as well uh, that are not pictured here. Uh, we have a lot of focus on lots of primary sources. So we will have information on how to use primary sources and different primary sources that you can use. If you are looking up 
your own family history or the history of the people around you. And we also will have an activity where you can learn to read the census as well. We are, are planning on having, then having a big lectern full of all of the census pages as we did before. We're going to have strips of the census um, that are focused more on these uh, families that we're kind of following throughout the exhibit. And that way you'll be able to get a little glimpse of how to read these older documents because uh, back in the day they did use script, it was not typed and it's a little rough to read. But once you get the hang of it, uh, you really can start finding some amazing stuff. So we hope to create these little interactive introductory elements to get people into looking at these kind of histories. So any questions, feedback, we will love to hear from everyone. Will we be able to email slides? Um, oh. uh, it was a question in the chat okay. uh, from Francis. The recording, it's being recorded. Um, we definitely, uh, is there an easy way to email out the, to the group, Caitlin? Any sort of things from us? Yeah, I have um, at the end of the talk, I usually have a, a list of everyone's email addresses and I can send any any materials you guys have, resources, um, I can email to the attendees today. Of course, okay. We definitely can. Um, with this, we wanted to give like a little snippet, a little sneak peek. Uh, so it's not gonna be um, absolutely everything and what we'd send out wouldn't be absolutely everything. Uh, we want uh, people to be able to experience it here. Um, hopefully, knock on wood, we're looking for um, new ways to present all of our um, information that we have from exhibits and in our archives online. Um, I'm currently working on a project uh, to update our current website. It's a little um, outdated and very much under construction. Uh, but hopefully with that, we will have a space to hold all of this information for people that may not be from the area that can't get down here to see the exhibit. And we're um, hoping to actually um, have QR codes for each person in the exhibit where you can actually scan the QR code and then you'll have access to all of our primary sources. So any military records, any census, if we have any find any photos, um, any primary sources will be connected to that QR code. So if you don't have time to look through everything or you know have time to look through each primary source you'll be able to look at it from your phone from your house um and again like you can access all of these primary sources from our new website all right great yeah there's a, a couple of people in the chat saying that they're excited to see all the new components uh to the exhibit so that's really fantastic um you know for sharing all these different family stories. And I like the interaction, um, you know, getting the kids involved too with sharing their stories and, and the people that visit too. And they can um, share with everyone else um, their history or their experience living in Tuckerton. So very cool. Um, I'm kind of scrolling up a little bit. I want to make sure we get some questions answered. And for the activities, we were actually trying to um, hit every age group, something for the little ones until, you know, older, much older. Um, so we have, you know, coloring um, pages, the one that Adriana showed you. Um, we also have another census activity. Uh, the typewriter is aiming for um, people who are a little older and who could, you know, share their stories more. Um, and then, you know, they have the option to keep that story or if they want to post it up, um, they can. Though on those cards, there'll be a spot where you can write your name and your email or maybe your phone number and um you know you might get a call from me <laughs> <laughs> you, you, get a call from me, you might get an interview <laughs> <laughs> awesome <clears throat> good to know uh we have a question about what year the quakers or someone asked uh, the, the quakers comma what year was that um, i had the chat open and i believe uh Francis answered that question perfectly. Uh, the, first, 
She says the uh, first meeting house was um, 1709 and the current meeting house is 1863. Um, they've been here, the, they've been here since like the beginning in this area. Uh, the land was actually acquired from the Lenape to be Quaker land, um, even before like the town of Tuckerton itself was established. So it's been from the very, very beginning. And is that house by the lake there? You said it's a short walk from the seaport. Yes, um, it's actually like right on Route 9. It literally like, I was gonna say a five minute walk, but I feel like even that would be a lie. It's less than a five minute walk. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right down the street um, and then like across it. Okay, yeah, I'm sure, yeah, we pass, I know I pass that driving to and from work every day. I'm sure a lot of us do. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's really funny. I didn't um, actually notice because it's a little farther back. It is. Uh, there's so like I didn't notice it until it was finally pointed out. And like, also there's like a tree in front of it. And then I was like, oh, wow, well, cool, the meeting house. I didn't realize it was that close. Very neat, yeah. Um, all right, next question. Do you have an exhibit on farmer slash agriculture in Tuckerton? Uh, we don't have yet. a specific one yet. Yet. Mm -hmm. We might in the future, <laughs> maybe. We, in the David Map section, we are going to touch on it a little bit because he was a farmer. Yeah. Um, but of course that would take up to do the entire uh, influence of agriculture in this area because there's a lot of farming. Um, uh, in this area. I think if I'm remembering correctly, Tuckerton was also called Farm Town for a little bit, but I'm not positive. I might be mixing up uh, the industry names for Tuckerton. Um, but that would be an entire major exhibit on itself if we were to like really get into like how important agriculture was to this area. Yeah, and maybe it, you, you know, in some of the exhibits you have touch on it, but you know, not necessarily have its own. Yeah, okay. Um, what has happened to other items from the Tuckerton 1900 exhibit that you're not using now? They've been relocated to, um, different exhibits. Um, that's what, that's what we're trying to do. We are moving, whatever that isn't being used in Tuck, um, the new exhibit is being re relocated to different exhibits that fit it more. Um, I don't know any exhibits like anything like off like up on top of my head that I've moved to different spots, but there was a lot of things that we did just, you know, if it was like Parsons related or like clamming related, it will be relocated to the Parsons building um, because that's more, you know, connected to each other. Um, a little bit of it uh, has been moved upstairs. So we have items um, oh, yes, upstairs too. from uh, the historical society that got moved upstairs to the second floor of the lighthouse. It has its own little corner for now. Yeah, like um, Tuckerton Wireless got moved, moved up. Tuckerton Wireless. We had a large, um, gorgeous piece of artwork of Tuckerton Wireless that we actually put in Folk Art 101 uh, for now, um, which fits the theme considering it is technically a piece of folk art. Uh, so it works very well there for us. Um, and then there are other things that unfortunately we will just have to put in storage for now. Mm -hmm. um, but we are looking to eventually get everything categorized, hopefully put online, knocking on wood, crossing my fingers, it's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. um, and really make sure that like our whole collection is like displayed to the best of our abilities and taken care of. Yeah. Try not to have everything in storage. I'm trying to find at least a home for everything. Um, obviously there's some things that we can't find a little home for, so then it would have to be put into storage, but majority of everything did get relocated to different locations. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we have another question, uh, about the duck hunting industry, which I know Tucker and Seaport does have, you know, all those decoys. Um, so I guess anything else in regards to the hunting industry? Um, not in this new exhibit um maybe we in the future. are in the future definitely uh we are looking to um put a little bit more in the hunting shanty so right now i don't know if you happen to have been to uh the seaport but we have a building we call the hunting shanty um and it is essentially the decoy museum it has um so many beautiful uh decoys from all different points of time 
Um, and we're looking to kind of like activate that space in the future, like um, where we keep thinking of different ideas to, like we move some things from um, talking to 1900 in there. Like the hats. Um, so we're, <laughs> we're looking to kind of just like activate the space a little more, uh, make that place a little more fresh as well. Um, but that's another thing in the future. We have a long wish list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So our goals are to, over a period of time, um, slowly redo each exhibit. So hopefully, you know, in the future, we're doing it one exhibit at a time. Um, yeah. So like th our first exhibit will be Tucker to the People. Uh, the next one, hopefully, you know, will be Folk uh, folk Art 101. And then, you know, maybe the decoy or next the Parsons or the Surf Museum. So we're just doing everything little by little right now. Oh, it's very exciting. You kind of, you know, think about the space you have and the stories you want to tell and, and yeah. for each, each one. And I know it's a lot of work. <laughs> <It is. laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm hoping to do a lot of rotating exhibits. Mm -hmm. So um, I know like when there's certain holidays coming up, I'm hoping to make exhibits that are related to that holiday. Um, so, you know, you have something new to look forward to every month or every holiday. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my wish list right now. I'm hoping. <laughs> yeah, it's a great idea. Um, and then the last question I see in the chat for now, um, are you both partnering with the Tuckerton Historical Society for research as well? <clears throat> I did reach out to them um, for a couple things. I also reached out to the Barnegat His uh, Historical Society as well. Um, any information, any research or anything, um, I have been contacting them um, and the Burning Good Historical Society as well. Um, yeah, so any like questions, uh, the, any inside scoops? Um, actually, it's funny because one um, for the Cinderella exhibit, um, we were able to get some things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, doing a little research, I found out one of the historical societies had it and um, actually ended up telling them the story about, you know, Cinderella. And they were like, wow, I didn't even know that's that's something new. Um, so, yeah, we're just trying to, you know, hopefully they'll educate me on some research and I educate them on them. Um, and maybe, you know, they'll know the inside scoop where I could look for, you know, more information. Um, aside from you know the census and newspapers and other right. part of sources that's so cool <laughs> <laughs> like oh i didn't know about that um, yeah it was it was really funny um yeah you definitely have to come i think it's it's gonna be a good one it's gonna be a good exhibit <laughs> all right great oh let me see just people in the chat saying excellent presentation um and updating on these exhibits um so great job someone just moved to tuckerton recently and is very excited to learn more about the people in the history okay yay um, that's exciting. Very exciting i want everyone to come <laughs> come find me and I, I think that's it uh is there any remaining questions comments i think so all right so uh, could folks go on your website if they have any other questions or, um, uh, you know, questions about visiting or or more information about the, the updates? Um, is there somewhere where they could go? So right now our website is under construction. Mm -hmm. uh, so when, if you go on our website now, it's a little rough, um, but hopefully our, you know, our website will be updated soon. Um, but you are welcome to call um, Facebook. Um, I know on Facebook, it's a little bit more updated with like the exhibits and everything. So I would keep an eye out on that. Um, we also have um, a newsletter, like an email newsletter ah. that goes out um, every other week. Uh, as we get closer to the, um, the like final, like opening, the grand opening of this exhibit, um, we're probably going to send uh, a big like informational thing out about that. Um, uh, trying to think okay. about. What do you, uh, what's the timeline that you're kind of expecting just so people are in the, you know, have it in the back of their head. <laughs> it's coming around the corner, uh, coming down the pipe. We are thinking March. Okay. Oh, um, like end of March. 
Mid to late March. Mid to late March. <laughs> <laughs> Timeline moves a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's our that's our goal. Our goal is to probably like the mid end of March area. Um, so that's where you know fingers crossed if everything works out like it's supposed to work out. Uh, we will be open during that time period. Um, like Adriana said, there will be a big email blast uh, telling you you know about the grand opening opening and more information about it. Okay. Yeah. And Okay. If you would like to sign up for this uh, Tuckerton Seaport email blast, um, I'm going to put my email down below so I can get you guys uh, signed in. Just email me, contact me, and I'll get you signed up for everything. Yeah, sounds good. So you'll, if you sign up, you'll just get automatic notifications. Um, <clears throat> uh, like Arlene said, you can also call. So if it's like end of March and you're no, you know interested in knowing, you can always call the Seaport, which is uh, that number right there. Um, that I just put in the chat. So um, multiple ways of finding out more details about um, this new great exhibit that you could have going on. All right, anything else? I don't see anything else in the chat. Well, I also just wanna say I'm very excited, you know, for all of the new and exciting things going on at the Seaport. Um, I'm excited also to work with both of you guys, uh, Arlene and Adriana, um, and collaborate with you on Lunch and Learns or you know the Life on the Edge exhibit. So we're really excited to um, you know move forward with that too. Um, so uh, oh, I see you just put it in the chat. Mm -hmm. So everyone who's online or I'm sorry in the uh, uh, in the chat, you can see Adriana's um, email right there if you want to sign up or if you have any other additional questions. So. Well, thank you again, both uh, ladies, for that great presentation. Um, and we're excited to see the Seaport soon. Um, and uh, thank you for your time. Thanks, everyone who attended for your time today and listening to our talk. Um, and uh, we'll let everybody go for the afternoon. Hope you have a great day. Thanks. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.